Hello and welcome back to the Realm of Unknown. I apologize for this being delayed, but this is the special two-part for the Jim Thorpe series that I'm doing here. It's still our first two-part as long as I can, uh, you know, remember. So today it's going to be definitely shorter than the actual first part because that involved a lot of the backstory and a lot of the history of the town and the region itself. And here, as I mentioned before, it's going to focus a bit more on like a specific family and also like some of the surrounding area of Jim Thorpe and what they sort of established. And they're also the family that we also mentioned before being the founders of the Lehigh Valley Railroad, the sort of rail system that we discussed earlier in the last episode. And I'm just going to get right into it because, again, it's going to be kind of short and I don't really want to ramble on too much like the first part. So the family in question that we are talking about today is the Packers. In particular, I'm going to be talking about Asa Packer, who first established his family roots within the town and sort of had a lot of ties with the local economy and politics. And in addition, I want to talk about his immediate family and some of their descendants who remained within the town for several decades. So Asa Packer was a pretty remarkable individual at his time, I believe at his time period, he was one of, if not, like, in the top ten for, like, the richest men on, like, the globe. Like, he was loaded when it comes to money. And this is essentially because he helped establish the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company, aka the rail systems that we mentioned earlier, while also becoming a very major stockholder within, like, half a dozen other railroad companies. So he had a very, very firm grasp when it comes to the whole mining industry up here in PA and the surrounding area. In 1842 to 1843, he was also a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. And then the following year, he was the county judge in Carbon County, which is where Jim Thorpe today is. He also served two terms as the Democratic member of the U.S. House of Representatives during this little term beginning in 1853. He even also tried to run for president and also the governor of PA, but ultimately both of those nominations and campaigns sort of weren't too successful and he didn't get anywhere. However, he also helped establish the Lehigh University, which is located down in Ben Salem, PA, which is also within the overall Lehigh Valley area. There's a lot of weird, like, subdivisions when it comes to the PA area, so I apologize for anyone who's, like, confused as to where we are. We're still in Jim Thorpe, which is in Carbon County, which is in the Lehigh Valley area. So, again, it's confusing. But he did a lot. He did a whole lot of really interesting stuff and played a really major role in, again, both Jim Thorpe and the overall surrounding Carbon County area. And because of this, you, he continues to remain a staple to the you know tourism factor and the educational factor of the area. And probably the most prominent aspect of his life and his, I guess, heritage in a lot of ways uh, comes in the course of two mansions that stand upon the hills within Jim Thorpe and sort of overlook the downtown streets. So there, there again, there are two mansions, as I mentioned. The first being titled the Asa Packer Mansion, and the second being the Harry Packer Mansion. And Harry is one of his sons, and he sort of commissioned it later on. But the Asa Packer Mansion is kind of like the prime golden thing of the town. It is like the centerpiece, it overlooks everything, and it essentially is like where he, Asa and his family lived and grew up and sort of developed this industry slash town slash region. It's like this crazy thing. But the Asa Packer Mansion is, again, like this beautiful, beautiful three-story, like 17-room mansion. It's got a two-story covered porch, which is huge and amazing. My mom would be very jealous about that. And it's easily the most expensively decorated and furnished building that I have ever personally been to. The porch has this elegant like Italian sort of detail and it includes these sort of like arched values and like weird little curves and all these like awesome little little tiny details which you have to like stay there longer to really appreciate and unfortunately well I guess fortunately for me 
we had to wait a while for our tour to start so we got to appreciate this a bit more from the outside and unfortunately though we couldn't have that long of an experience on the inside because they unlock the building and then lock it back up for each tour so no one can really get in on their own so the interior again is also like extremely lavish so it has like period furniture everything is what it was nothing has really changed they have to like update certain things they would get it from that era like everything is the same it has the original woodwork there too which is probably the most incredible aspect that i found on the tour of the mansion they have these like little small ornate flower slash decorations that sort of line the entire like main floor of the of the mansion and there are thousands like thousands of these things I, that again these are this isn't an actual number because i forget what the tour guide actually told us but there's a lot like there is so many of these little things they're tiny they're very very tiny they're probably about the size of like half a golf ball give or take and each one of them is hand carved they're all different types of wood and stuff and every single one of them has a unique and individual pattern just like thousands of patterns just all individual all this stuff and from what I can remember from the tour I think it was mainly done not I mean yes it was done for an aesthetic aspect but I think also Asa like very much wanted to give back to the like surrounding area and he wanted to make business a very big thing and from what I can remember, I believe he did this so that more wood craftsmen like had a job and it was an ongoing thing that they can continue to be paid for, which was like amazing. Like apparently he was like a really, really great guy. I don't know personally because, you know, I don't know him. I can only go based off of historical documentations. But for the most part, he seemed like a very genuine person for the region and really wanting to make it something more and continue to give back to it because i believe he came from nothing or he came from like a very not like he was nowhere near his level of rich when <laughs> when he grew up like, let's just say that so that was the asa mansion and real quick i want to mention the harry packer mansion which unfortunately i was not able to personally walk into and tour and explore and everything the weekend that i visited or the weekend that me and the people I went up with uh, visited, they just so happened to be having one of their overnight murder mystery sleepover type events at the mansion, and uh, we couldn't get in, unfortunately. But it's equally as beautiful as the Asa mansion. It has this very bright uh, red brick as the outside. It has this, like it's beautifully colored. It has a bit more of like an Italian style for the architecture. And it's got its own little bell tower on the part of it and these little neat stairs that lead up to this incredible side porch area that you can sort of get like they have tables set up for people to have like brunch and stuff on. It's really amazing. Like it's really special. This one in particular too is like a side little fun fact for anyone who may be listening. This particular mansion, the Harry Packer Mansion, this is actually the mansion that inspired the model of the haunted mansion that Disney owns. So if you're ever on the Haunted Mansion ride, I believe there's one at both Disneyland and Disney World. I could be wrong though, I haven't been to either. If you have been there and you have been on that ride, this is the mansion that they modeled it after. So if you're ever in the area and you want to check it out and you want to go on a murder mystery uh, like extravaganza, definitely check it out. I would definitely recommend it or at the very least walk by because again, it's extremely beautiful and it's definitely a really neat place to just kind of stroll about. So yeah, that's like a brief little rundown of some of the history that with Asa and how he helped sort of establish Jim Thorpe and Carbon County. Now when it comes to the ghost stories, I'm going to be talking about a few of these locations that I mentioned, uh, along with sort of Asa's other relatives. In addition, I'm going to be talking a bit about another location that's sort of nearby, but has some... and. It has some connections to the Lehigh Rail Company, as well as, you know, like Asa and all those. Like, it, it just has a lot of history. Everything's kind of connected. And this is the number nine coal mine. So this is actually located outside of Jim Thorpe over in uh, Langsford, PA, which I believe on a map is technically a little south, 
like southeast, give or take. I I didn't correlate the two of them. I'm basing this off of our trip, which was a year ago. So bear with me. So we're gonna be talking about this uh, after we talk about some of the stuff with Asa and his family. So on to the ghosts. So the very first story that we're gonna be talking about is actually about the Saint Mark's and John or excuse me, St. Mark's and St. Joan's Episcopal Church, which is located in downtown Jim Thorpe. And we're going to be talking about the spirit of Mary Packard Cummings, which is my name. (laughs) Um, My last name, that is. It's just funny. When we were on the tours and they mentioned that, I was like, (gasps) and uh, the person I was with was like, (gasps) and it was just, it was a fun little moment. And it was like, his name's Cummings. And the tour guy was like, oh, cool and i'm like oh god why'd you mention that so yeah so about this story we're going to be at this little church and this story surrounds a tour guide by the name of carlene laden i believe is how her last name is pronounced and she is a tour guide for the annual rotary ghost tours that sort of take place within jim thorpe itself they kind of take you around different spots around the town and her experience within the church so Her experience takes place prior to becoming a tour guide. So this is when she was a singer within the choir at the church. And they were recording this sort of like album, I guess. I don't, it doesn't go into detail as to what they were doing, but they were as a group there at night and they were recording some like professional, they said CD. So that clearly dates where, when this is being recorded. So if that adds any context to what this is, what's going on. There's a church group and they're recording some songs. So Layden is quoted as saying this for her story and bear with me because it's a little long, but I, she words it well enough that I feel as though I don't really need to restructure her words to feed it to you guys. She's pretty thorough on what happened. She is quoted as saying this. My view over the top of my sheet music was to the back of the church. My eyes saw movement and were drawn off the page to the back of the church. There I saw an old woman walking into the main room. She started to walk around the back of the church. It was very distracting in many ways. There were two large stone pillars within the back region. She would stand behind one and then stick her head out as if she was trying to be discreet and not to disrupt the group during our recording. However, it was still pretty distracting. Then she would shuffle off onto the other pillar, hide, step out, watch us for a little while, and then step back. Finally, she was standing in the back of the church, in front of the baptismal found, which is in the back of the church and is sort of this large gold ornate object. She was standing in front of it, completely blocking my view of it. At one point, I was looking at her, and right before my eyes, she started to dissolve. It was the first time all night I realized that I was looking at a ghost. She had looked like a regular person in the flesh. So after witnessing this old woman disappear, Layden asked if anyone else saw her. Out of the approximately 50 members in her group that were all there recording, about 12 other people saw this woman walk in, do all her stuff, and then sort of disappear. They all sort of discussed what they witnessed. They were all asking questions like, who is this person? Is she like someone's grandmother? Why is she here? Is no one going to like ask her to leave? What's going on? And all their stories matched up. They all had the exact same experience. And it's odd that only 12 saw it, but it's... I would say significant that that many actually saw her and all saw it at the exact same time. Months after this event, Layden would be on a personal tour of the church and she was being led around by another member of her choir group at the time. And during their little like just like kind of strolling around type tour, they ended up downstairs and walking past a painting that was hung up on the wall. And this painting just so happened to contain the likeness of the woman that was witnessed by the group during the night's recording. So the group member who was guiding Layden around explained that the woman within the painting that she was curious about was that of Mary Packer Cummings, who helped pay for the chapel, her father helped add, you know, further construction onto it, 
and she even helped with installing an industrial elevator in the front entrance area. And Mary Cummings, or Mary Packer Cummings, she's the daughter of Asa Packer. Again, this really incredible, really well-known guy. From what I can remember, she is one of his oldest children, from what I can remember. However, I believe she lives fairly long in relation to her siblings. And she has a lot of history with the town, a lot of history with sort of helping out the community, and she has a lot of history when it comes to this church. Again, she tried to help build it up, she put this elevator in, and funny enough, she, she did want to be the very first to ride this elevator. She, she was like, hey, I'm installing this, I'm funding this, I want to ride the elevator. However, unfortunately, she did pass away before she could, and I believe she passed away in 1912. Her casket was able to be put onto the elevator and ridden down, technically allowing her to keep her wish, which is really sweet. So aside from uh, Layden's story, today many claim to still witness Mary sort of wandering around within the church, this being observed by people both inside and outside of the building. Those who report spotting her oftentimes claim that they feel as though she's sort of watching over them. As if Mary is almost still watching over the churchgoers and those who are part of the, like the flock that she helped establish. Which is a really sweet sentiment and it's really nice to just see like this really kind ghost that sort of just lingers about. And it's something that you sort of see carried on and like a trend that you see within Jim Thorpe. That a lot of the spirits that you may witness or these sort of sightings and claims and reports and all that. A lot of them have to do with people who really help build up this town and make it what it was. And now they're just sort of hanging about and still sticking around. And that sort of carries into uh, the next ghost that I want to talk about really briefly. And that is Asa Packer himself. So people still witness Asa Packer, you know, this prominent, like, almighty figure in this town, essentially... Uh, they still witness him within his mansion up on the hills. Oftentimes, reporting to see him sitting up in the cupola of his mansion, looking out over the large town clock, which has like a perfect view from where he would be. With many claiming that his specific type of haunting or sort of lingering as a spirit is very much in tied with him being stuck in his sort of scheduled routines watching out over the town that he helped establish, along with waiting for the trains carrying coal to arrive into the terminal. Which is kind of kind of somber in a way, but also, again, kind of sweet, the fact that he's still kind of sticking around, and he's kind of like keeping an eye out onto the town and sort of watching from above. So as for the rest of the mansion stories, I can't... There's not really too many, and from what I can tell, there aren't really any like haunted ghost tours or anything for the Asa Packer Mansion. Aside from you know any like bizarre sounds or uneasy feelings, people don't really report any other like supernatural visitors, so to speak. I will say, however, that it did have a strange and little offsetting feeling when walking around the mansion, because again, I toured this one in particular. And you very much feel out of time in a lot of ways. It's very, very distant from the outside world. It's very like cut off in a lot of in a lot of ways. And you really feel as though you sort of stepped into a different era. And it's a little off-putting, but it's still an incredible experience. And as for the Harry Packer Mansion, I could not find anything actually pertaining to any hauntings or you know murders or ghost stories aside from the actual murder mystery weekends and then the connection to the haunted mansion for disney so it seems as though harry packer is not sticking around and his mansion just continues to be inspirations for other things relating to the paranormal and supernatural so good on him i don't know um but if you are there and you have any weird you know experiences or know anyone who had any weird experiences definitely let me know i would love to check it out because from what i've could understand people have stuff but no one seems to be reporting on it at least that i can find online i again i didn't know any of these places were haunted when i was visiting and unfortunately i was not able to ask any questions on the matter because i didn't know 
and I'm sure a lot of the locals and the people who work there and the people who run all these like museums and stuff probably would have a few answers for me whether or not it's definitive or they just outright tell me no it's not I was not able to ask so unfortunately I eh, it's not so unfortunate because I really do want to revisit this place so I guess now I have a reason to go so wrapping up this this part, this episode, and this overall series, I want to talk about a, another location that I visited during my trip there, which is the number nine coal mine. This place, like, is insane. I had never visited or been to a coal mine up until this point. The closest thing that I could compare it to was entering Crystal Caves, which is another attraction here at PA, and I don't know if I'll talk about that in any other episode. It technically has some ghost stories but not really all that many but if you are interested let me know it's a really neat little tourist attraction in pa in which you can go into this like quartz crystal cave with all these like intense shimmering rocks and stuff like that however the number nine coal mine is a like legit massive mine and like massive coal mine with several routes and turns and like a small little trolley that you have to ride in order to like enter into the mine because it takes you about like I think the actual number is around 1600 feet into the mountain like you're going in there that's I mean that's not technically close to a mile but that's pretty close to a mile into the mountain and there are a lot of spots that are still extremely dangerous and they're blocked off to visitors and staff however they did convert it into, you know, a tourist uh, location in O2. So they did make it, you know, safe to visit. However, there's a massive portion of the mine that is still unused and untouched today. So while visiting, it was certainly very scary, especially if you don't like small, wet, and like dark locations. However, I, again, I didn't know that this place was haunted or like reportedly haunted uh, at the time of my visit, but... Even so, and I'm not just saying this to like, you know, spook you out more or try to make this seem more legit than ever. Like genuinely, while there, I still took a lot of photos and almost immediately got this sort of like strange sensation that I kind of should take photos. I it was a little like off putting in a little in a in some ways. Like it, it wasn't so much like the people I was with, it was like, just once we got into the location, after we got off the little trolley and we got going on to the tour, it was just, like, this real bizarre, like, I should really, like, look around a bit more. And I don't know why. I, again, I don't, I don't have explanations for why I might feel things at certain spots. I just don't, I don't know. And, again, I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. Aside from, like, another tour guide further on into the mines which kind of spooked the entire group but he's like yeah no it's just them they're like 10 minutes ahead of us however i didn't technically look over all my photos and videos that i took during this trip so who knows i'm gonna be posting a lot of them so if you guys spot anything in the photo maybe tell me part of me doesn't want to know part of me kind of does but we'll, we'll leave it at that but it doesn't mean that you know other people have not experience things in the mines the museum that we got our tour through the like the general historical tour they also host their own ghost tours into the mines during the fall season and it sort of started it off due to many people believing that the spirits of several generations of coal miners were still lurking about and working deep into the caverns so during the tours guests are guided down and shown a lot of like weird things they're shown the remains of like accident victims within the mines who were not able to be recovered at the time of the incident along with a lot of like horror stories about how miners were treated what they had to go through it, it was not a pleasant place to work a lot of people died several came down with illnesses and injuries while working on the job they also had to work in complete and utter darkness with only like a single candlelight to guide them through the tunnels, which during our tour, they let us experience. And I, I will say like Crystal Cave was dark when they shut off all the lights. This was so dark, even with the candlelight being nearby, 
we were only maybe five feet away from the tour guide who had the light in his hand. It was utter darkness, even with the light. It was insane. I don't know how people worked in that environment. I don't know how that's even functional to make that an environment, but they made it work, and I would never want to do that. The mine also employed a lot of uh, child labor and like minority labor. They also used a lot of mules and donkeys in the mines during the early years, and it was just a really not great thing and they it added a lot of despair and you know negative energy to the whole environment which could potentially play some role into the feelings that people get today people who visit the mines oftentimes report sudden drops of temperature and sort of everlasting coldness when they arrive to certain areas in particular when they arrive to the hospital which is inside the mine itself so this is a very creepy place. Trust me, I have I have some photos of this and I will be sharing this one in particular. It's this like small little white wall essentially that has like hospital stuff written on top and it's not technically open. You can't go into it really. They sort of have stuff there but it's not accessible to the tour guides or to the, like the general tours. And it's essentially where, like, the injured and the sick would be brought if they didn't want them to exit the mines or if it was, like, a much more serious, immediate injury that they had to tend to. And people suffered and they some died in that spot. So it's understandable that this is, like, the craziest location. But for the most part, people sort of report this coldness to it, this real, real coldness. To put this into perspective, the mine itself remains at like a pretty steady 54 degrees throughout the entire year like it's pretty even it doesn't really dip it very rarely fluctuates and people are recommended to wear jackets wear coats most people have those on so if they're still reporting that they're getting bone chillingly cold goosebumps and all this stuff it is much colder in this spot so what is causing it I don't know. I Maybe it's like a draft. Maybe it's a difference in air. I don't know. I'm not a mine expert. But from my experience at that spot, there's nothing evident within the general vicinity that would cause a dip in temperature. And I didn't personally feel it. So I can't account on that actual event happening to me. But I can say that I couldn't find anything... Or from what I can remember, I can't notice anything that would cause there to be like an immediate draft or shift in temperature. So who knows? Maybe something's actually happening there. So people also report hearing distant sounds within the mines, including the sounds of footsteps, metal clanging against rocks as though it's like a pickaxe in the distance, the sound of voices in areas in the mind in which people should not be present, or there shouldn't be anyone else in the mine. Oftentimes these are reported by tour guides or other people who work there who know that no one else should be there. In addition, the sensation of unease is often reported. However, uh, as mentioned before, that can sort of simply be chalked up to, you know, you're in a mine. <laughs> so that feeling uneasy is sort of par for the course. I couldn't, however, in, in addition to other stories, I couldn't find anything more like concrete or more extreme in any ways no one really reported any apparitions or anything to like a higher level for the most part it seems as though it's pretty average for when it comes to a coal mine in particular and this specific coal mine is is actually the longest continuously operated coal mine in the world it closed down, I believe, in the late seventies, but at that time it like it held it still holds the title from what I can remember as being like the longest ran coal mine. So it's not too unlikely that you might have a few stories and some you know, bizarre reports of sounds in the distance and odd sensations that people sort of feel uneasy or sick in certain spots of the mine. Because that sort of seems as though that's what happens in these coal mines. Especially ones where, you know, a lot of negative feelings and tragedy and despair kind of remain. But yeah, that's it for this story. I Again, it was really quick. Uh, I felt as though all these things added together sort of could have been their own episode. 
However, I wanted to lump it into the Jim Thorpe series as well because I felt this whole environment was like one big experience and adventure for me and I kind of wanted to emulate that with these two episodes. And then, you know, the like I mentioned in the last episode, these ones kind of... Uh, I felt as though a two hour or plus episode would be too long. Um, so I kind of split it down the middle of being around like an hour or so and then being about like an hour or being around like 40 minutes give or take from like by me editing it fully by you know give or take you should probably cut down but yeah i mean so for the most part that's kind of it for this episode um there's not a whole lot more that i really want to talk about if you guys again want to support this you know this in endeavor this podcast this brand i guess essentially you can guys can check me out over on the patreon that we are currently sort of pursuing a bit more uh not like hard but sort of pursuing a bit more than we used to be and uh that's realm of unknown on patreon the links will be in the description for both the actual podcast and then on youtube if you're listening there and again, if you want to just really send in your own stories or talk about different topics that you would like to have me discuss in future episodes, then you can send those to me either on Twitter or Instagram at Realm of Unknown or to my email at Realm of Unknown at gmail.com. So I thank you guys again. Um, I'm not really sure what the next episode will be. I have a list, but I'm kind of going a little bit out of order at the moment. So, you know, bear, bear with me there. And I will see you guys next week. Or by the time this gets out, uh, it should be the next Saturday, give or take. So, yeah. <laughs> I hope to see you guys then. And I hope you guys had a very, very enjoyable time with the Jim Thorpe series. And remember, until next time, to stay spooky.